Hey guys, welcome back to another session of Bible Unplugged. I'm Wave Nunley and we're back to our series on the Sermon on the Mount. Today we're going to be looking at Jesus' instructions on prayer. It's a really important topic. It's something that touches every one of our lives. So I hope that this ends up being a blessing to you and ends up being instructive for your own personal prayer life. Um, we see in Judaism an emphasis on prayer, which just then makes total sense that Jesus would take a whole section of the Sermon on the Mount to discuss this important topic. So we're going to look at Matthew chapter 6 and Jesus' instructions on prayer. Uh, we're going to be looking today at three key points, and we'll try to emphasize these again at the very end. We're going to look at Jesus' teaching on the length of prayer, and we're going to talk about the, the invocation or the address, the, uh, the Our Father who art in heaven. And then we're going to look at the first petition. Um, that may come as a little bit of a surprise to you, but that's okay. And it's going to all uh, sort itself out when we get into the prayer uh, per se. So, with respect to length of prayer, Jesus has some really important instructions as He's ramping up to this Our Father or Pater Noster or the Lord's Prayer, the Disciples' Prayer, the, moder the Model Prayer. Um, and, and He does this beginning in, in Matthew chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. There He says, when you're praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, pagans who don't know God don't have a, a relationship with Him and don't really know the appropriate approach to Him in prayer, as Gentiles do, because they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. I wonder how many Christians think that, are convinced that uh, the volume of their prayer, or the intensity of their prayer, the location of their prayer, or the length of their prayer, some kind of way gains us greater entree into God's presence or benefit from His, um, uh, His actions back toward us as a result of prayer. They think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, and Jesus' instructions are very clear, don't be like them. Don't be like that. Don't take that kind of attitude to God in prayer. For your Father knows what you need even before you ask. Now, let's take a look at a couple of vignettes in Jesus' life uh, where His uh, practice of prayer is on full display. In Matthew chapter 11, we get, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, so He's praying here, that you hid these things from the wise and understanding and, re and revealed them to babes. Yes, Father, for so was it well-pleasing in your sight. Here we have an example from Jesus' life where He's praying and the prayer consists of only two senten sentences and only takes about 10 seconds to pray. Here's another example from Jesus' life, though, where in Luke chapter 6, we're told that Jesus went away to be alone on the mountain and He spent the whole night in prayer to God. So do we have some sort of schizophrenic practice of Jesus where He prays short prayers, but then He also prays long prayers that last all night? Uh, where exactly does Jesus practice in His own prayer life match up with this don't pray um, uh, lengthy prayers of repetition because, like the Gentiles because they think that they're going to be heard for their many words. How exactly does this shake out? I think that the Jewish interpretive tradition helps to sort that out. So we go to the early rabbis. In the Babylonian Talmud, we're told that Rab, Rabbi Huna further said in the name of Rabbi Meir, and Rabbi Meir is a late first century early 2nd century sage. So once we're hearing this teaching of Rabbi Meir, we're in a 1st century, early 2nd century setting. A man's words should always be few in addressing the Holy One, blessed be He, a nickname for God that we see replicated in the New Testament in various forms. Since it says, don't be rash with your mouth, and don't let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God because God is in heaven and you on the earth and therefore let your words be few. And this is a Bible verse. 
This is not Rav Huna. This is not Ravi Meir. This is a divinely inspired text from the book of Ecclesiastes. Let your words be few. So there we have a great example of Jesus teaching one thing, the rabbis teaching the same thing, that prayer should uh, typically consist of few words before God because God is so much greater than we are. He's got so much better perspective on the big picture. On the other hand, we have another text that says, that gives us, like Jesus' life does, the both and. Let's take a look at a text from Mechilta to Rabbi Ishmael, and this is a, uh, it's called a Midrash text, so it's interpreting Bible passages. Exodus 15, And Moses cried unto the Lord. The rabbis say, From this you can learn that the cries of the righteous are not hard for God to receive. This is what's so interesting about us. A lot of times our prayer practices reflect an inappropriate concept of God. Maybe He's too little or He needs our help or um, He needs encouragement by our praise or whatever. Um, God is self-sufficient in His own being. And this is exactly what we're getting here. Prayer isn't hard for God to receive. He receives the prayer from His Son um, with only two sentences being uttered. The Lord's Prayer takes about seven or eight seconds for us to repeat by memory. Um, so if God is a big God and He's loving us and he's, it's not hard to reach Him in prayer, then um, we ought to have pretty, uh, a pretty wide set of flexibility uh, when we come to God in prayer. Well, by the way, you also learn that the prayer of the righteous is to be short. Remember the words of Rabbi Meir in the earlier text. It happened once that a disciple in the presence of Rabbi Eliezer, again, a late first century, early second century sage. So we're well within the context, historical situation of the New Testament. In the presence of Rabbi Eliezer, he went up to read the service. He's going to say a blessing and then read from the, the scriptures. And he made his prayer short. The other disciples remarked to Rabbi Eliezer, did you notice how so-and-so made his prayer short? And so they used to say about this guy, this is one scholar who makes his prayers short. But Rabbi Eliezer said, he didn't make it any shorter than Moses did as he, Moses prayed in one prayer in his request that God heal his sister Miriam. Heal her now, O God, I beseech you. One short sentence in the book of Numbers chapter uh, 12. Well, again, Another disciple went up in the presence of Rabbi Eliezer. He went up to read the service and made his prayers, his, the blessing before the reading. He made his prayers long. The other disciples remarked to Rabbi Eliezer, Did you notice that so-and-so made his prayer long? So they used to say about this guy, This is one who makes long prayers. But Rabbi Eliezer said, and here's the moral of the story, He didn't make his prayer any longer than Moses did. As it said, and Moses is stating this in Deuteronomy, I fell down before the Lord for 40 days. So Rabbi Eliezer used to say, check this out, there's a time to be brief in prayer and there's a time to be lengthy in prayer. This helps us to understand why it is that Jesus would at certain points pray very short prayers and at other times pray all night long. This is within the tradition. It, it appears that what the, the, the big picture of, of this tradition is saying is prayer should be Spirit-led in the same way that other areas of our lives should be led by the Spirit. You know, Paul says, if we uh, live by the Spirit, we should walk by the Spirit. If we've been made alive by the work of God's Spirit in our lives, then He, the giver of that life, should be guiding us as we walk out that life. Makes perfect sense to me within the tradition. So now, Jesus says, once, we're talking, once we've got this idea of a short prayer being okay with God and that the Lord's Prayer or the model prayer, the disciples' prayer, is, is a very short prayer, then Jesus says, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
I've put this, formatted this in its poetic parallelism in a way that we do uh, most of our um, material that comes from places like the prophets or much of Jesus' teaching. It is in poetic form, it's in parallel form, and so we're trying to reflect that on the slides. Continuing the Our Father, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven those who are indebted to us. Don't lead us into temptation, rather lead, deliver us from evil. And then there's the conclusion, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, what we're going to do with this uh, prayer is to focus on the first few lines. We're going to look first at the address, uh, the invocation, the Our Father who art in heaven uh, that begins in verse 9 and is the introduction to the rest of the prayer. This is the address to God or the invocation. Our Father who art in heaven. Where exactly does that come from? Wouldn't it be almost like assumed that when we pray our Father that uh, we are praying to God? Why do we need this additional information or explanation? Not our Father on earth, but rather our heavenly Father, our heavenly parent. Um, well, what we get is in early rabbinic literature, this is a common way to refer to God. So, for example, in the earliest rabbinic stuff that we have from the Mishnah, we hear, when all the great leaders and wonder workers died, on whom do we depend? On our Father who art in heaven. So it seems like when we're in a difficult situation because we've lost le important leadership, then how do we respond to that? We depend on our Father who is in heaven. Um, also, same text, from the day that the temple was destroyed, and we just had an observance of Tsha B'Av, the, the, the ninth of the month of Av, where the two temples' destruction was commemorated, memorialized. When the temple was destroyed, the things um, continued to get worse, uh, then on whom do we depend? And so, uh, an important institution, something that is crucial to, the central to uh, the faith. Who do we dep depend upon? Our Father who is in heaven. Temple might be gone, but God's not going anywhere. Our Father who is in heaven. In the footsteps of the Messiah, in other words, when the Messianic age is about to dawn, insolence and licentiousness, destruction, sin increased, D uh, respect decreased, and the face of the generation will be like the faith's face of a dog, unrepentant, un unresponsive, and disobedient. Uh, dogs were not looked upon in ancient times as man's best friend. The face of a dog. A son will not respect his father. Upon whom shall we depend in those difficult times, the days just preceding the dawning of the Messianic era? Upon our Father who is in heaven. Same kind of reference that we get at the beginning of the Lord's Prayer, or the Disciples' Prayer, or the Model Prayer. Here's another text from another of the earliest collections of rabbinic material that we have. A ma'aseh, or a story, actually an event, uh, regarding Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai, who was riding on his donkey. And Rabbi, this is just such cool material. Why? Uh, because it's reflecting historical reality, yes, but it's telling us all kinds of interesting things about the culture and, and about religious practice. So Rabbi Eliezer um, uh, uh, ben, uh, uh, Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai was riding on his donkey, and Rabbi Eliezer ben Arak, another late first, early second century sage, was riding behind him. The, the disciple always rides or walks behind his rabbi. Uh, we covered that back when we were dealing with walking after the rabbi and that whole um, collection of uh, segments uh, of a uh, video on the rabbi-disciple relationship. So, riding along behind him, Yochanan ben Zakkai alighted from his donkey and he wrapped himself in his talit, his prayer shawl, and the two of them sat on an outcropping of rock under an olive tree. Really vivid, interesting 
uh, uh, first-hand memory we got going on here. And he presented the subject of the chariot before him. This is Ezekiel's chariot chapters uh, that then reflect the Shekinah presence and the glory of God being manifested among human beings. Uh, Yohanan ben Zakkai stood up and kissed um, the, his disciple and he said, Blessed be Adonai, the God of Israel, who gave a son to Abraham our father, a son who knows and understands how to expound on the glory of our Father who art in heaven. There we have that uh, same phrase that begins the Lord's Prayer or the disciples' or model prayer. Eliezer ben Arak, who understands well enough to, underst uh, to expound on the glory of our Father who art in heaven. We get it a second time in the same uh, passage. So this then is not something that Jesus is presenting as brand new. It never been heard of or practiced before in uh, Judaism prior to this time. It, instead, it's being presented as this is the way we typically go to God in prayer all the way to modern Judaism and the prayer book that is used in the synagogue today. You have prayer after prayer after prayer. That are mo these prayers that are modeled on prayers in the Talmud that begin, Avinu She Bashamayim, Our Father who art or is in heaven. Uh, almost a way that you could say, Our Heavenly Father. Um, it's a beautiful way to begin a prayer and something that is not unknown in Judaism. Now, we can prove definitively this idea of God as Father is not unique to Jesus, not new with Jesus, because in the Dead Sea Scrolls, all pre-Christian, all prior to the birth of Jesus, uh, more than a dozen times you have God referred to as Father and even prayed to as my Father. So um, that argument uh, is now a, a moot issue. It's no longer uh, uh, debatable because we have de definitively pre-Christian material from the Dead Sea Scrolls that refer to God as Father and even ref uh, have references of prayer to God as, uh, as Father. I actually did my doctoral dissertation on that very subject. So um, when Jesus is presenting His um, uh, model prayer, He starts out praying in a way that is very standard, very typical, uh, well-worn, well-known within the Jewish community of the first century in the land of Israel. Now let's take a look and we're going to spend the rest of our time on this first petition. After God is invoked, after He is addressed, Avinu Sheba Shamaim, our Father who art in heaven, <clears throat> the first thing, the first petition, which I think is usually overlooked because it's thought to be a parallel to our Father uh, who art in heaven, is hallowed be thy name. Well, let's, let's just get this out of, uh, of the way at the very beginning so that we can go deeper into the meaning of this hallowed be thy name. The only time that we hear of this word being used is something like Halloween. It's a word that was in English um, uh, for hundreds of years but has now been almost washed out of the language in favor of more updated words that mean basically the same thing. Um, and the only kind of vestige of our use of this uh, word, hallowed, is in uh, phrases like Halloween. Okay, so what it doesn't mean is holy is your name, or we praise your name, or your name is holy. Um, in fact, in the original language of the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, the, this word is in the imperative. It's in the voice of command. It's like an exclamation point should be placed behind it. It means, instead, uh, to hallow in ancient uh, English, mean, meant to consecrate or to sanctify or to help others recognize the consecration or sa uh, sanctity of a certain thing or person. Um, so we hear this as early as the Law of Moses, the Torah. Moses um, has God say to him, um, because you did not trust me to sanctify me, to hallow me, 
to consecrate me, to cause others to treat me as sacred, as holy, as, as, as separate and different uh, in the eyes of the people of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land. It has to do with his striking rather than speaking to the rock uh, the second time. And so this is the, one of the first times that we get this kind of language about sanctifying God. It's like, well, how in the world does that happen? Isn't He already holy, already consecrated, or, 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 or uh, already sanctified, sacred? Well, yeah, of course, but there's something else that's going on here. Take another Bible passage, and this is, these are all texts from Jesus' Bible, the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament. In the book of Isaiah, when Jacob's children see the work of my hands in their midst, they will sanctify my name. This is a passage, if you go back to the 29th chapter of Ezekiel, uh, rather for, of Isaiah, where the prophet is um, condemning the people, he, he is rebuking the people for their disobedience and their failure to respond to the call of God appropriately with um, submission to God's will. And so um, after he's made this statement, then at the, he begins to, in the latter part of this chapter, he begins to delineate all of the things that they are going to do when they do become obedient, when they do become responsive, when they are submitting to God's will. So notice these words, to, to obey, to submit to God's will, to be respo appropriately responsive to the call of God, then they will sanctify my name. He's describing how this sanctification process is going to play out, how it will happen in real time when obedience occurs, when submission to God's will occurs, when proper responsiveness to God's call takes place. Then God is, God's name is sanctified. Hallowed or sanctified or consecrated be your name. Okay, let's go look at another one because it gets better, it gets even easier. What Ezekiel brings to the table is that he juxtaposes or places in uh, points of comparison when God's name is sanctified and when God's name is profaned. So let's take a look at what Ezekiel says. God is speaking through the prophet and God is saying, I am going to sanctify the holiness of my great name. Remember, hallowed be thy name. I'm going to sanctify the holiness of my great name, God says, which has been profaned. Notice, sanctify versus profane. Now, what causes the one and what causes the other? My name has been profaned among the nations and which you, my representatives, my people, you have profaned among them, among the nations. And the nations, when my name is sanctified, the nations will know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God. When? At what point? When through you I sanctify my name before their eyes. So some kind of way, even though, yes, God is already holy, He's already separate, He's other, He's, uh, he's special and should be treated that way. But some kind of way, there's something going on in the way that we behave that will either bring sanctity or profanation to the name of God. Let's continue. When we move from the, New, the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible into the period between the Testaments, we have as an example, Ben Sirah. He's writing sometime around 180 B.C. to maybe as far back as 220 B.C. But he basically perfectly splits the intertestamental period in half. He comes right in the middle of the time between Malachi and Matthew. So in Ben Sirah, by the way, this is a perfect example from the intertestamental period because it's actually a prayer. And so Ben Sirah says, he's praying to God and he says, God, lift your hand up against foreign nations and let them see your might. As in us you have been sanctified through people, God's name has re achieved greater repute, greater reputation, is, gr is more highly exalted, respected, 
as in us you have been sanctified, so also in them may you be magnified. Sanctified, magnified before us. So here's a great prayer where Ben Sira is saying, May your name receive a greater reputation. May your name receive greater sanctity, treated as, as, as even more holy by other people because of the way that we act, because of our behavior, because of the way we conduct our lives. So yes, indeed, God is initially and in and of His own uh, doing, His name is great and to be hallowed. But there's something else going on here that then involves us in that process. Let's take a look at a passage um, from a, another text from Mechilta to Rabbi Ishmael, a midrash or a Bible interpretation text. And this is what we get from the late first, early second century. When Israel does the will of God, then his name is sanctified in the world. And whenever Israel disobeys God, then his name is profaned. This is the same kind of language we get from Ezekiel, this sanctified versus profaned. And so what is it that determines when God's name achieves greater reputation and, and, and sanctity? Uh, and, and when is it that his name is, uh, receives greater profanation, is looked at as common and, and, and uh, of, of no real value? When His name is sanctified, it's when, it's when God's people do His will. When His name is profaned, it's when he, His people disobey Him. Um, don't treat Him as Master and Lord and respond with obedience, with, uh, uh, appropriately to His uh, call to whatever. So when, when God has addressed our Father who is in heaven, he is looked at as the great king. He's looked at as, as our parent that deserves our absolute respect. And then when that's followed up by, may that great name, that name of our Father who is in heaven, uh, is, um, is hallowed, is sanctified or consecrated, then it's because his people have lived in such a way that others outside the covenant look at us and they see our attitudes our motives, our priorities, how we treat one another, how we treat people outside of our covenant community, how we respond to God's word in either obedience or disobedience, um, God's work inside of us that produces overflowing fulfillment and satisfaction and joy that's evident by other people, then we are sanctifying, we are consecrating uh, God's name to a greater degree in the eyes of those kinds of people. When our lives are the exact opposite of all those things, including especially disobedience and unresponsiveness to the Word of God, then that is when God's name is looked at as more common and God Himself is looked at as just another um, object of worship, just another deity. Nothing special here, nothing really here to see, just keep moving on. And so as we've looked at this, uh, at this address, at the length of prayer, as we have looked at the um, address, our Father, and then the first petition, may your name be looked at by other people as sacred and consecrated to an even greater degree, special and to be honored and respected. Um, these things have become pretty clear to us just in these first few lines of the Lord's Prayer or the Model Prayer or the Disciples Prayer. We looked at time uh, of prayer. It's okay for prayer to be short. It's okay for prayer to be long. The situation and the guidance of God's Spirit to meet the need of the situation with our response to that need, that's, both of these are totally appropriate allowed within the tradition, um, role modeled by Jesus Himself, and totally okay for us to walk that out behind Him. With respect to God as Father, this is not something that's new, but that people would quickly embrace and um, would uh, accept as being, yes, this is, this is the way we have been praying, the way that we've been living all along. 
What Jesus gets in trouble with about this God as Father is when He makes Himself the, own, the unique and special Son of God. But not that uh, He's showing God or revealing God to be our Heavenly Father for the first time and it's totally unique and has no um, antecedent in, this, in the Jewish tradition. So this is not new. It's simply coming out of, springing from our covenant relationship with God as our heavenly parent. And then the last thing that we covered is the importance of um, us asking God to empower us to live in a way that gives Him glory, that, that increases His reputation, that increases the level of respect that He and His name should receive from even people in the world, people outside of the covenant community, as they look at the way that we treat each other, the way we treat people outside the covenant, the way we treat God, the way we respond to uh, the call of, uh, of God, the way we obey Him. So, so much of this hallowing of God's name Yes, in this world and by others is dependent on the way that you and I respond to other people and the way we respond to our God. I hope that as we've discussed these three major points at this very beginning of the Lord's Prayer, the Disciples' Prayer, that uh, it will uh, inform you in terms of your own prayer practices and will also serve as an encouragement to live out that faith on a regular daily basis. Not in your own strength, but empowered by the Spirit of God. That we put to, It's through the Spirit that we put to death the deeds of the flesh, as Paul says, and that we sanctify God's name, increase His reputation, Increase the respect that everyone has by the way that you and I live our lives. Let's do both. Why not? Let's pray the way Jesus taught us to pray, the way He role modeled for us to pray, and let's also live out those prayers in our daily lives in consistent covenant-keeping relationship with God and with others. God bless you as you continue to seek Him in the coming week. And may the Lord give you plenty of opportunities to pray both long and short prayers, to address Him as your heavenly parent, and to live that kind of covenantally consistent life out that will be a blessing to other people and truly show to them the nature, the real nature of the God that we serve. God bless.